My name is Cynthia Melcher. I'm Executive Director of the World Affairs Council. And I'd like to begin my apology tour by saying I apologize that there are no cookies. <laughs> I tried an experiment. It worked horribly. There will be twice as many cookies next time, I swear. The second thing I need to apologize for is Gary Breton is very sorry. He cannot be here. He's our president of our board of directors, and he's usually the one who does this job while I'm running around making sure everybody who wants tuna gets tuna. So if you want a tuna and you didn't get tuna, I apologize for that too. Um, welcome to um, our World Affairs Council Instant Issues event. I'd like to begin by um, thanking our sponsors for this event. They include Wells Fargo Advisors, Wilbraham and Munson Academy, AL Signoli and Company, and Prosperity Candle. Um, I'm going to try to acknowledge the board members present, and hopefully I won't miss anybody. Um, I'd like to thank Jeremy Cole, who is our, our technical maven again today. Uh, Ken First, Rob Humberston, Rich Redeker, and John Young, and have I missed anybody? Anybody? No. Okay. So very many thanks to our, our board of directors. Uh, those of you who are not members, you will find a little white card out on the front. Um, we are, as Gary puts it, a cheap date. Um, and we rely very heavily on membership. So if you would please consider uh, becoming a member. If you are not yet, that would be great. Um, I want to quickly bring to your attention, you'll see our annual report. Many are floating around. First of all, if this is from our annual meeting. It has a lot of good information about the World Affairs Council in general. But in particular, I wanted to bring your attention to pages 17 and 18, which uh, lists some upcoming program. And um, I especially want to draw to your attention that on Monday, November 12th, we will be having a dinner at the Marriott in downtown Springfield featuring Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who's the former US ambassador to Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, and Syria. So the invitations for that will be going out later this week. I think it's going to be a fabulous event, and I hope everybody will get it on their calendars and, and try to come. I think it's going to be an excellent event. And also, on November 7th through 9th, the World Affairs Councils of America, which is our national organization, will be having its national conference in Washington, DC. If you want more information, uh, you can check their website at worldaffairscouncils.org. And if you can't remember that, you can call me or email me, and I will send it to you. And also, if you have, I, I think I'm going to be sending out something about that before the end of the week via email. I also have a list of extra hotels in case the Mayflower Hotel is full. OK, our speakers. Uh, because we have two speakers and a bit of DVD to show you, um, I, have, I have said that the program expands to 1.30. However, our speakers say they may be done by 1. But if we go beyond 1 and you need to leave, you should feel completely comfortable to do so. Um, a lot of people ask me about speakers. I'm the one who, who, who books all of our speakers. and. Um, on my, maybe not my long list, maybe not my short list, but my medium list, Burma has been on that list for probably a year and a half. And I've been looking for a speaker and looking for a speaker and asking around. And then in the spring, uh, many of you know my daughter attends uh, Bard College at Simons Rock in Great Barrington. And she is a junior there now, but we were there in the spring because she was getting her associate's degree. And at some point during the commencement ceremony, Wu Ba Win was introduced from Burma, who works at the college, who's an administrator at the college. And I thought, that's my guy. And I emailed him, and he very graciously consented to come. And he also said, and we should bring Jonathan Doster too. So that's how, that's how these, these things happen. Uba Win is Vice President of Early College Policies and Programs at Bard College at Simons Rock in Great Barrington. He has worked at Bard for 33 years, 23 at Simons Rock, and 10 in New York City as co-founder of the two Bard High School Early College Programs in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He grew up in Rangoon and attended Rangoon University for a year before completing his undergraduate and graduate education in the United States. 
Ahn Sang Suu Kyi was a couple of years ahead of him in high school, and they have reconnected during periods when she was not under house arrest. He's been working on creating Burma's first liberal arts college for almost two years, and they are at present negotiating a memorandum of understanding. After the talk today, Bao Win will be headed to JFK to board a plane and go to Rangoon for the sixth time in the last 12 months. Photographer Jonathan Doster, a native of Georgia, the US state, not the country, has been based in Sharon, Connecticut since 1986. You laugh, but around here you say Georgia and it could be either. Uh, in addition to multimedia production, cinematography, fine art exhibition, portraiture, and freelance commercial work, he has been involved in a variety of projects, including a book, uh, Vitor the Condor. His works have been published in Terra Sauvage, Atlanta, Time for Kids, and Yankee Magazine. In 2004, his multimedia tribute to Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King, Bombay to Birmingham, was presented at the United Nations, and it was also presented at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge in 2010. His travels with the camera have taken him throughout the world, including to Burma, and we will see a portion of his DVD Burma drama today. So please join me in welcoming U Ba Win and Jonathan Doster. Thank you, Sid, and uh, the World Affairs Council, Jeremy Cole for being here at 11 to set things up. And for all of you taking time out of your day to hear what we have to show and say about Burma. Uh, Uba Win really should be heading this, uh, but he graciously asked me to come, having seen the video this past summer, to uh, create a, an atmosphere which I help, hope will support what he's going to say. Uh, I was in Burma last year. I left Thanksgiving Day and stayed 12 days. And so these are the impressions I had in that brief time. Uh, a country almost the size of Texas, uh, 12 days, it would have been superficial to try to see everything and impossible. So I concentrated on various areas where you, you'll see the temples in Bagan. I spent five days there. Mandalay uh, and the surrounding area, four days, uh, and a day in Inlay Lake, and two days in Rangoon. So it was pretty quick, but it, it made a deep impression on me. Uh, and I hope I can impart some of that through the music and images. Uh, I, I should say that the soundtrack you'll be listening to, it's very exotic, world ethnic, and is entirely unauthentic as far as Burmese music goes. <laughs> Burmese music, from what I've heard, is atonal to our Western ears. Uh, there's a certain cacophony and uh, pitch to it that didn't seem to work with the images. So uh, in time, I'll perhaps come across some music that's right on. So if we can have the lights, I will present my impressions of Burma.
can see these remote areas and then people's white speck on the mountainside. And somehow a dredge was built. Some are only two stories high, some are palatial. Uh, I was just amazed with the beauty and uh, uh, the thought struck me that Western civilization, all the, the cathedrals of uh, Western Europe had no idea <coughs> what the Burmese were constructing and creating in their culture. Yes, sir. Uh, two things. Uh, number one, uh, I noticed that the first pictures that you had, especially of some young children, uh, there seemed to be a sadness in their face, a sadness in their eyes. And then later on, when you got further along in your, your little travel hub, uh, I noticed that, uh, that there was a lot of laughing, and, and especially when he got to the marketplace, so maybe food had an effect, I, I don't know. Uh, was there, were you trying to show the difference between Old Burma and New Minamar? Wow, that's pretty profound. <laughs> I wish I could accept that. I uh, know. Yeah, the first boy, I don't know about sadness, uh, just seemed to be really connected. Uh, he was one from a family, uh, with one of the two families, and the girl, Mona, uh, I didn't think she was particularly sad. She had a little joy in her face. Yes, sir. And the second thing. Uh, the white that was on a lot of the faces, was this to show a certain class of people? Oh, the tonka? That's a, a paste made from the bark of a tree. And my understanding, part sandalwood. sandalwood tree. And the three uses I was told uh, was uh, one, it's more just decoration, makeup, uh, moisturizes the skin and protects the skin. I used it instead of sunscreen. Uh, uh, primarily uh, women and children work, but have you ever worked? <coughs> it's actually the opposite of moisturizing. Uh, it's a paste from the sandalwood bark that uh, you make by rubbing the bark with a little water against the stone. And you put it on uh, right after bathing. And huh. sandalwood has a very pleasing, fresh yeah. smell. So when you put it on, you feel as if you just took a bath, in addition to really having taken one. What it does as it dries is that it absorbs the facial oils, you know, and then it drops off after a while. Um, and, uh, and it turns out uh, a very, very fancy resort over in Lennox. Uh, what's it called? Canyon Ranch. Canyon Ranch. Yeah. Yeah. Canyon Ranch. Um, has a sandalwood treatment too. They charge uh, a lot of money though. Uh, and they make a lot of money <laughs> uh, from it. But, uh, but you know, people uh, decorate it, uh, as you saw, there are many shapes. Sometimes, uh, or recently, one fashion was to uh, dip a leaf on the paste and put it on so you get the imprint of a leaf on your face, and eventually it falls out. Thank you for. Uh, that finer point. And also, you can see it on their arms, necks. Um, you know, when I first got to the airport, I saw it everywhere and throughout the stay there. And at first, it was, it was odd. And then, then it became the norm. And I thought, when I came back to JFK, not to see it all. So, I, I saw a certain beauty. At first, there was I don't know, eeriness or not quite, I can't find the word. It's just unusual. Yes, sir. With all the shots you had of the different monks and monk students, um, is that a fairly recent phenomenon? Have they been under some form of repression in prior periods, or has, has that actually traditionally been carried on through what we perceive as political repression? Well, when I'll elaborate on this, my impression of it's been there for uh, <coughs> hundreds of years, but there has been oppression. Uh, I think especially 2008, there was a crackdown in the government. Thousands of monks were beaten, killed. Be nice, uh, but there, it's a strong uh, part of the culture, the Buddhist culture. Uh, the, uh, Buddhism is practiced by a large majority, probably 80% <coughs> of the people uh, in Burma. And uh, uh, Buddhist men, uh, have the practice of entering a monastery for periods. You, you, you know, uh, as a child, you get initiated. It's the equivalent of a bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah, uh, where you do 
serious study for a few weeks. Um, uh, but then periodically you may return. Uh, and when you do return, um, you may, if you choose, shave your head. But you may also uh, go back for a period of meditation uh, with just in, uh, as a civilian uh, without doing that. Um, uh, the, the, uh, among monks, uh, there's also kind of degrees of, let's say, scholarly, scholarly pursuit. You know. uh, Mandalay is the, uh, the, the major intellectual center. So those monks who do the equivalent of a master's or a PhD would have, uh, well, would gravitate there uh, and uh, meet with senior monks. Uh, some of these people would even travel to Sri Lanka, which also has Theravada Buddhism, uh, or to Bodh Gaya uh, in, in India, where the, the Buddha uh, started his life. Um, uh, but then, you know, you get to uh, lower levels where uh, uh, lower is uh, not the word I really want to use. I, I mean, um, uh, where you are seriously interested, but you're not prepared to make that deep of a commitment uh, to the monastic life. So, so you see monks all over the place. Can I just tell you to use your mics? Yeah, I was just aware. And also, uh, and yours is already on. Yeah. I, I, I want to wrap this up. Um, you can talk to me afterwards if you'd like. If you'd like, because Uba Wynn is the main speaker here. But uh, One last question relating to that or not, uh, the show? We're good? All right, thank you. Uba Wynn. You, um, you know, sp speaking of Burma is like speaking about my family. Uh, I can go on and on. Uh, about different aspects. So uh, what I thought I'd do is to see if, uh, if you are interested in my giving you a quick uh, thumbnail sketch of Burmese history and how it became a Buddhist state, um, the post-independence period, the military period, and what has happened since then. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, the first Burmese kingdom came into being around 985. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the story is that a group of uh, Buddhist monks from India arrived uh, in central Burma in the Bagan area, Bagan being right in the middle. Um, and they uh, converted the, the then uh, grandiosely called king. Uh, his name was Anorata, probably at the time uh, he was not much more than the, the head headman of a bunch of headmen uh, in the large area uh, uh, surrounding Bagan. But he very cleverly used Buddhism to consolidate uh, his rule. Uh, that is to say, uh, uh, unify all these people by saying, we will uh, set aside uh, the uh, pantheistic beliefs that we've had, beliefs in spirits and, and all the things that could harm you, and uh, follow uh, this central path. Um, and, uh, but the astonishing thing is that within years, even before the death of this king, around uh, a beginning, in, uh, his rule began around 985, uh, some startlingly beautiful pagodas were built. Uh, one of them, that first one, is still there. Um, and, uh, and you can, when you look at the pagoda, see the Indian influence, because after all, these monks were from India. And uh, they'd been building uh, those kinds of religious structures for you know, quite a while. Um, but by the time of his son, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the design imagination just took off and some major departures got made from Indian um, uh, uh, pagodas. Uh, by the time uh, Kublai Khan sent his Chinese troops over in 1285, 300 years later, in, uh, Bagan in a 10-mile square area had built 
well over 10,000 pagodas. Um, and, uh, and the other astonishing thing for me is that uh, hundreds of these pagodas have survived uh, over a thousand year period, you know, particularly in an earthquake prone area. Uh, there was every reason under the sun for all of it to become a pile of rubble, but they did not. You know, they, they survived. And I hope you'll all have a chance to uh, go and take a look. In the, uh, in the pictures, uh, you saw these balloons. That's a fabulous way uh, to see it because uh, when you're above all these pagodas, you then get a, a, a true sense of the scale. Okay. Um, the kingdoms that followed uh, uh, had one flaw. Uh, Burmese kings never figured out a system of succession. You know, uh, the British, for instance, had primogeniture. The oldest son of the first wife uh, would be the heir apparent. Uh, that was not the case. So uh, over... Uh, 850 year period, every time uh, there was a, a, a change, uh, there would be a mad scramble for power. Uh, kings would have many wives, and each of those wives would want their son uh, to be the king. And so there was, the place was always filled with intrigue. And then when, the, uh, the, when someone succeeded, uh, he would put to death whole rafts of half brothers and cousins, um, and uh, and and uh, uh, so it was the most devious, usually, who made it to the top. Not necessarily uh, the best suited uh, for ruling, uh, but on it lurched. Uh, and at times, uh, Burma was quite large. It would, um, the Burmese armies would conquer, annex, all the way into what's now Bangladesh and all the way into uh, Thailand, all, uh, to the edge of Cambodia. Uh, uh, but where the, their undoing, the Burmese king's undoing, came from uh, a different direction. Uh, when uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, a Burmese expedition went into Bengal, into what's now Bangladesh, uh, the British had just then made uh, an appearance in that area. Uh, the local Indian prince asked for British help, and, and uh, 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 that, by the way, was how they swallowed India piece by piece, you know, the whole Indian subcontinent. Um, the, uh, the, the Burmese king thought, well, just another enemy, so I'll send an army uh, to uh, beat them. Uh, not, realizing, not realizing at all that Britain was a maritime power. And uh, so when the Burmese army got dispatched to Bengal, the Brits just came with their fleets to the uh, southern part of Burma and began swallowing it up piece by piece, which they did after three wars by 1885. Um, and uh, so Burma became part of, uh, uh, became a British colony. Um, and uh, that remained until 1948. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi's father, whose name was Aung San, Actually, her name, when I knew her as a kid, was just Suji, you know. And the uh, the contemporary name Aung San Suu Kyi uh, uh, was to emphasize her lineage, you know, the, the, that that she was from a very very distinguished uh, family, that she had a very distinguished father. Um, so Aung San uh, negotiated with the British for uh, independence uh, for Burma. Unfortunately, uh, a few months before independence was granted, he and a whole group of people, people were assassinated. A whole group of uh, fellow leaders were assassinated. Um, and uh, 
So Burma lurched into uh, independence uh, with a much diminished group of leaders. Um, most of the really able people were dead and gone, had been killed. Um, and the others did as best as they could. And they were largely successful. In the uh, early 50s, uh, the uh, Burma was uh, as developed, or I, maybe close to, uh, have enjoyed close to the level of development that Singapore had. Uh, and uh, the, the major universities in Asia were, um, uh, I mean, east of India, uh, were Rangoon University, the National University in Singapore, and Hong Kong University. The uh, people, uh, wealthy people from neighboring countries, did their shopping in Rangoon and in Singapore. People from Kuala Lumpur, from Bangkok, came uh, to these very cosmopolitan um, uh, places. Um, and uh, uh, sadly, in 1962, uh, the Burmese government was uh, taken over in a coup d'etat. Um, I should mention that uh, a number of items. One is that Burma was fought over fiercely. Uh, it was bombed when the Japanese came, and it was bombed again as the Jap Jap uh, to make the Japanese leave. So there was not much left uh, to the major cities, Rangoon, Mandalay, and, and uh, a number of other places. Uh, the second thing was that uh, there was uh, uh, the, the, the British, as you will have read, had a divide and rule uh, policy. That was how uh, they came in. Uh, and uh, that had its legacy. Uh, that is to say, the, the ethnic groups that lived around the country um, had never really seen themselves as being from Burma as much as having bilateral relationships, the Shans with the British, the Karens with the British, and so on and so forth. So when they left, um, it was uh, a bunch of people who barely liked each other, who were left behind in the shell in a container called the country of Burma. And uh, also, uh, uh, the country was afloat in weapons. Uh, the Japanese had left weapons behind. The British and Americans had parachuted weapons into Burma to help locals push the Japanese out. So uh, you have a very bad combination you, you know, of people uh, who didn't really trust each other, but all of them armed to the teeth, uh, and uh, willing and unfortunately um, resorting to you know, different uh, uh, struggles, uh, each claiming a struggle for you know, independence and, 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 um, and, and uh, to move the Burmese aside and so on and so forth. So in the first dozen years, of the Burmese parliamentary democracy, that government had to struggle with a lot of uh, these armed insurrections all over the place. Well, to fight the insurrections, they had to supply the army. So the army became even better armed, and that, of course, makes them strong beyond what, what you would want. So in a way, the coup d'etat that happened in 1962 was inevitable. Uh, you, you, you know the um, and uh, and the man who took over then, a man by the name of General Ne Win, was a really odd character, xenophobic to the extreme, um, and uh, uh, he led what was then a fairly prosperous country down uh, into a. Uh, I mean, uh, he he brought in. Uh, a 49-year-long uh, dark, dark night, um, from which we have emerged. Uh, 
for completely um, surprising reasons. I mean, I still scratch my head. Uh, I never thought that I would see any change uh, like this in my lifetime. Um, uh, what happened about a year and a half, or two years ago, was that uh, they said they were going to, uh, uh, the army was going to give up power and that they would have a parliamentary democracy. And we all looked at each other and rolled our eyes and said, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially since what was happening was that officers were resigning their commissions and running for uh, for uh, for office, you know, to to uh, become parliamentarians, um, and uh, another thing that they did uh, was uh, to uh, not permit Aung San Suu Kyi's party, the National League for Democracy, to participate in the electoral process. You know, they did all the things that just made it patently clear that uh, that it was. Uh, a, a, a false election, uh, that they were going through with the form without having any of the substance uh, of having um, uh, uh, a parliamentary democracy. But they kept moving on. And uh, then uh, a man by the name of Thay Singh, who was a general, who also had quit, uh, resigned, and joined uh, the government party, the, the military's party, uh, was elected president. Uh, the speaker of the house is another notorious character um, who is uh, thought to have given the orders to shoot uh, the civilian population back um, in around 2007, 2008. A man by the name of Thurash Man, he became the speaker of the house. and. Um, and they elected a whole slate of people. Uh, and we all thought, well, so what's new? You know, they've just, it's a chameleon. It's emerged in another form. But, but then we began to uh, see su surprising things happen in the parliament. Um, there would be talks. You know, uh, uh, parliamentary sessions would be uh, reported, and parliamentarians, these former colonels, these former majors, these former lieutenant generals, began to be critical of the way things were going in their districts. Why wasn't this road built? We paid for this road twice already. It's still not here. You know, why are these? Why are people going to hospitals? Uh, where uh, there aren't any doctors. Uh, why do we have so much trouble? They began to voice the complaints, the common, common complaints of the people. Uh, it was just shocking. Because in the past, if anybody had stood at a street corner and raised some of these issues, and they had, they were just made to disappear. You, you, you know, but here, where these former police, uh, I mean, army officers uh, uh, talking like this and getting reported you know, in the government newspapers. And then um, Thang Singh got up one day and made a speech inviting um, Burmese people abroad to return. He said, we've, been, we've gone through such bad times for so long that uh, we don't have the resources or the people with understanding and knowledge uh, to perform the task of transforming this country that is ahead of us. You could have pushed me over with a feather. Um, because they'd always seen um, the people who'd left as um, kind of a mouth Piece, mouthpieces of the government in exile, you know, the people who can be counted on to be critical no matter what you did. Um, <coughs> and for, for him to say this was just unthinkable. Then a few months later, uh, 
Thura Shoiman, the, the man who ordered, who's, who's said to have ordered the, the, the gunning down of hundreds of people, Thura Shoiman upbraided the civil service um, and his uh, and the ministers, because now he's in the legislative branch, you see. So he takes a pot shot, a big pot shot, a cannon shot, <laughs> um, at all these ministers who said are just not doing enough. Uh, and he just uh, excoriated them in an hour's uh, talk that was, again, very, very well reported. And um, and uh, soon after that, uh, a number of ministers, uh, there was a cabinet reshuffle, and a number of ministers, about a third of them, uh, were made to step down. You know, um, my reaction was, this is great, but you know, when's the other shoe going to drop? Uh, because the, the army is still there. Um, you have to figure that there must have been hundreds of senior officers who were disappointed because they'd been patiently waiting for their turn at the trough. And now, you know, you have a different kind of government. They're no longer uh, going uh, to have these privileged positions that would enable them and their families to become very, very rich. So at any time, you know, uh, they can take over. Um, and that is still true, and that is still the case. You, 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 you know, so um, the, 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 there's much more uh, openness uh, in, in the country. It's nothing like Thailand yet, yeah, you know. But uh, the policemen and the military that you saw at intersections are all gone. Um, and, and they were also like devoted apprentices. Yep. I mean, they were everywhere. They were everywhere, yeah. Uh, they're, they're gone. They've moved back to their, their barracks, which is where they belong. You, you know. And um, uh, so far, so good. Um, uh, you know, as to why the general who was in charge, why he relinquished control, no one really knows. I mean, there are all kinds of stories. Not least that he's um, uh, 82, 83 years old now, and, uh, and, uh, and th so that was going to be, um, uh, that, that he would fade from the picture was inevitable. Uh, but uh, that all of them as a group would uh, somehow loosen control so that a new generation can step forward uh, is really heartening. But also, uh, you know, it's not a, a foregone conclusion that, that uh, they will succeed. The struggles ahead are huge, are enormous. Uh, 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 one reason is that the army has been, had been implacably against uh, education. Uh, soon after they took over in 1962, uh, they uh, leveled the student union at Rangoon University because that was the place from which uh, students would go out and demonstrate you know, in, in the streets. Not that the students were always so noble, I mean, was, you know, but what would frequently happen is um, a fight in a tea shop between two hooligans uh, would draw a lot of people and even more soldiers, and before you knew it, they were shooting at the people. You, you know, so what would have started out as a stupid event um, would end up being uh, uh, an event where people uh, felt great sympathy for the victims of all the, the shooting and all the picking up. Um, and uh, in the decades that followed, uh, the only real organized opposition to them was always from students. 
uh, so uh, they just, their attitude was, well, you know, uh, forget about these people. Uh, the devil get the hindmost. They created parallel institutions for themselves. That is to say, the Defense Service Academy would create a Defense Services Medical School and a Defense Services University and so on and so forth to meet their own needs. But as far as the needs of the, uh, the general population were concerned, um, that, that, that was not their priority at all. So much so that after 1988, they shut Rangoon University and Mandalay University down and they opened community colleges all over the country um, in smaller towns, you know. Um, and, you know, and the, the reason for it is transparent. If you have kids spread out all over and somebody acts out in Pakoku, you just shut the roads on each side of town and you deal with it. You, know, you don't have thousands of people in one place. Um, and, but when they did that, they didn't have enough teachers. They didn't even have the facilities. You know, they just, uh, uh, so, oh, uh, and alternately, uh, every family learned that uh, a way for mobility for their children was to join the army, you know, and to go to their schools uh, and, and use that route uh, to find a, a better spot for yourself. Um, so um, here we are 49 years later with a big hole in the middle. You, you know, the uh, people educated pre-1962 are at least my age. I'm 65. And, uh, uh, and only now can we start uh, setting up more serious uh, institutions. Um, so uh, even with all the goodwill and the good intentions that we have, I don't know how we're going to mobilize uh, to do the things that, that uh, need to be done. You know, uh, the population has more than doubled. Um, when I left, the population of Burma was around 20 million. And it's now, uh, and, and I left in 1965. The population is around 50 million plus now. Uh, uh, and uh, the, we have a fairly large country. Uh, as you mentioned, it's as big as Texas. Uh, not as quite as large as Texas, Texas but larger than France. Um, so we're not yet overpopulated. Uh, we, I should say we, we don't yet have the population density that some of our neighbors have. Um, uh, but the task is large, and how it can be pulled off remains to be seen. To an outsider that knows very little about the area, maybe four years ago, Burma seemed to be just like North Korea, you know, just lightened. And yet, at least in the West, it was a report of all kind of activity like we saw in the Mideast this year with all kind of student center unrest. Was there any kind of eureka moment or anything that you can sort of get a feel for that made the, at least the change start? I can't think of some crystallizing uh, moment. The, uh, the, uh, except for one, the cyclone that came through uh, killed a lot of people, uh, somewhere around 130, 140,000 people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when you fly into to, to Rangoon, if your plane happened to go over the delta, um, there's no way uh, those people could have escaped because it's just flat um, and it's, it's a delta, it's just a few feet above uh, sea level. Um, there are no roads, you know, it's laced by little streams all over. 
Um, so that, that many people would die, is probably inevitable, given the se severity of the storm. The, but the Burmese government's reaction to it, though, uh, is just unconscionable, inexcusable, um, because they placed their fear, uh, uh, that is, that the Americans who had um, supply ships just outside Burmese territorial waters ready to unload tons of stuff that was desperately needed. They, placed that, that they, they, they feared that that would lead to an invasion, so they kept them away, and they just prolonged the agony you know, and the suffering of all, all, all the people. And it was just one more example of, of that kind of rigidity uh, uh, of holding themselves above everybody else, you know, uh, because so not long before that, they uh, uh, arrested, beaten up, killed, made a, m a number of monks to disappear, and not long before that, uh, when uh, a couple of young people had been demonstrating at Scott Market, which you will remember, uh, Bojo Market, uh, they were protesting uh, the sudden hike in fuel prices. Uh, that led to another crackdown that you know, resulted in hundreds of people being taken away. Um, so those three things in a row may have, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the Arab Spring happening around the world uh, may have made them say, we better do something while while we can arrange to hand it over rather than having it taken away from us. We can say, yeah. Are you familiar with the Mustache Brothers? Yes. In Mandalay? Yes. My question really is about individual expression of um, artistry or culture. You know, it was repressed for a long time. And I'm wondering today if the people of Burma have that right for either political expression or cultural or artistic expression. <laughs> I, I, I think they have, uh, you can assert more of that right, but what will happen remains to be seen. Because people are... Um, I mean, can the Mustache Brothers now perform in the Burmese language? Yeah, they do. Because when I was there, they were forbidden to, to because they spent time in jail, and one yeah. of their conditions of the release was they could only perform in English. Yeah. No, uh, I saw them in November. Uh, and, and, and they performed in Burmese, and, and they were hilarious. They're hilarious. The, the, yeah, these are, uh, th uh, it's a little bit like Larry Moe and, yeah, 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 it's a little slapstick, but with a lot of very clever zingers uh, in there. In fact, they make it so slapstick that you're tempted to not take them seriously, except when you hear the zingers, you, you, you know, and they're very sharp. Um, uh, but people are uh, not pushing it uh, uh, because they don't want, in my, my interpretation, is that they don't want to create a situation that just tempts the army to, to step in. You, you know? So I think uh, uh, the exercising that free speech, uh, the, the right to be insulting, is being held back. I think probably wisely. First, the young lady to my left and I agreed that your remarks were not only interesting but fascinating. Uh, do you think that uh, real reform uh, would be evidenced by a change of the name of the country? Myanmar back to Burma, and that the government would change in Gan, Dr. Rangoon, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I myself am not for going back. And the reason is this um, uh, Myanmar was always Myanmar when I was speaking Burmese. It was the Burmese name. It was. In, in Burmese, uh, if I were speaking uh, to my brother, 
I would not call our country Burma. I'd call it Myanmar because it's the common Burmese name. See, so it's not something that the military invented. Um, they just went from uh, using the British name for Burma to the Burmese name for Burma, which is Myanmar. And, and Yangon was always Yangon. Rangoon is uh, an anglicization of Yangon. It was um, uh, a Burmese newspaper article written in 1955, let's say, you, you, you know, would have referred to the capital city as Yangon. Uh, but not the English language newspaper. The Nation and the Guardian would have called it Rangoon. Do, do, do you see? So, so it's just they're insisting that the common Burmese name be uh, spelt in English. You, you, you know. But uh, I know what you mean in that, uh, that the army tried to you know, legitimize their existence by uh, making these changes. And the West said, not so fast. You know, there'll come a day when that may be OK, but not now. You, this is a little too hokey. Question on education. You mentioned the um, junior colleges, but at a low, lower level, are children being educated at least in basic um, reading, writing, and so forth? And uh, what is the level of illiteracy? And also, if you could speak to the, uh, how pervasive is at least the basic health care among people. It's a great question. Um, in pre British times, and referring just to the Buddhist areas. The literacy, uh, the rate of literacy in Burma exceeded that of literacy in England. This was, uh, this was a report written by the Brits. And the reason was this. Um, as a child, uh, you would go to the monastery, and the monks would teach you how to read and write, and very, uh, very, very basic mathematics, OK? Um, uh, because that was part of the inculcation into the Buddhist religion. Um, and uh, when the British came, uh, they established higher level education, secondary schools all, all over the place. When, uh, but in the uh, military period, uh, we got so poor that uh, although there are schools all over the countryside, uh, then there's frequently not staffed or uh, not adequately staffed so that you might have 80, 90, 100 children in a class. And then as, uh, uh, and, and to make it worse, uh, pay for teachers was so bad that uh, although in principle, education was free. As a practical matter, teachers would charge children all kinds of fees, you know, so that you would have a parallel school that began after the school day ended, so that the families with some money would end up sending their children for a repetition of what ought to have been offered, you know, uh, in, in, in the morning. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and that is still a problem. The, in the, this last budget, they doubled the amount uh, set aside for education. But, you know, uh, doubling $100 is com com different from doubling $10. You know, when the base is so low and miserable to start with, the happy thing is that it signals the right direction. The unhappy thing is that it's still hopelessly uh, insufficient. Okay. Another thing that I would say in the privacy of this room is that the, the Minister of Health, who has begun to serve under Teng Sein, is an amazing man, uh, just doing wonderful things, and um, knows how to work 
with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and you know, all the uh, uh, foreign uh, medical organizations uh, that, that have c come into Burma, the Men Minister of Education is an idiot. I mean, I mean, you know, the kindest characterization would be a nebbish. Uh, and he, he's just afraid to make any decisions. I've met him twice, and I just walk away thinking, other than being able to say that he was not part of the military establishment, they could not have found a more feeble person. So, you, you, you know, uh, I, I think things need to change. You mentioned about education, now just about health, but what's the state of the, the general economy for and what do you see as the forecast for that? Um, the, the money investments have been, investors have been flooding in, mostly from uh, uh, Singapore, from uh, Thailand, you know, Southeast Asian uh, countries. But uh, Aung San Suu Kyi um, had a piece of uh, caution for them, which is that until our laws concerning contracts and commerce change, people ought not to hurry in because um, they'll find themselves mired in the old system of having to pay every last person along the way in order to get anything done. Um, so I'm glad to see money coming in, but I'm also, um, uh, I hear that the parliament has been working overtime on uh, coming up with laws uh, that will more reflect the investment community's interests. Yes. Um, do you know the current relationship that Burma has with China? I mean, it appears to me that during the height of the, when the military was in charge, they were heavily influenced by China and their relationship with China. Yeah. And I'm curious of what you think their relationship is now with the new government. Well, you know, we pushed them into it. We pushed the Burmese government into China's arms, uh, me, meaning the U.S. and the West and everybody else, you know, by cutting Burma off from the international monetary system. They couldn't get a nickel out of IMF or the, uh, none, or the UN or any of these places. They, uh, they couldn't even go through the bank for uh, monetary conciliation. In other words, uh, because of the, uh, the bans that we placed on international commerce, uh, uh, Visa and MasterCard could not operate in Burma. Um, so uh, they went to the only source that they could. Now, I'm part of that group too. I wanted to starve them. I wanted to do everything I could. Uh, I supported every international action that would try to force them off. So I include me in we. Um, uh, but they, but it had the unintended consequence of Burma looking to China uh, for, uh, you know, basic support. Um, uh, but that seems to have turned the corner with the Myesong Dam uh, project. Uh, there was to have been, oh, uh, some oil, but mostly gas deposits were discovered uh, just below Bangladesh. They must be grinding their teeth because it's mild, <laughs> within six miles of their border uh, uh, that these deposits were discovered and, uh, uh, and a pipeline is being built from the Bay of Bengal across northern Burma into Yunnan province. You know. China is very interested in that because their coastal provinces have become very wealthy, but their interior provinces have really stagnated. You know, and uh, by having um, gas coming into Yunnan gives Southwest China a boost. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, so that was well on its way. And uh, 
Mieson would have uh, given them a lot of electricity in, in Yunnan again. But Mieson got canceled for ecological reasons. Um, and, uh, and China had already put in a few billion dollars, and they were not happy. Uh, but, the, uh, but this government used the opportunity to wean Burma away from China, you know, provide a little bit more of a balance. But who would, you, who would the Burmese consider their friends in the world today? If it's not China, who is it? America. Yeah, I know. Uh, she isn't was, that astounding? She was just in the State Department last isn't month. Isn't that astounding? <laughs> You know, I was there when she was in the building. Yeah. And there was, everybody was talking about her because she was in the building. Yeah. There was a yeah. level of excitement. Yeah. And, uh, our program, Bard College's uh, liberal arts uh, program in Burma, will likely be called the American University of Southeast Asia, with American right there in the front. Um, you know, there are other American universities, American University in Beirut and American University in Cairo. Uh, uh, but you know they're happy to have some semblance of balance uh, reappearing in the strategic uh, picture. And and uh, U um, Teng Seng, the president, and uh, U So Teng, who's a senior minister, uh, were just here two weeks ago for the UN General Assembly, and uh, they met with um, a lot of. Uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce type people, uh, you know, to get them to return to Burma. They also met with uh, people from uh, Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation. These large major foundations used to play a very active part in Burma in the 50s, and they want them to come back. Asia Society is another one. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, Sue just grabbed me and said, the best sit ever. <laughs> so um, we have a little something for each of you. These are from Prosperity Candle, one of our um, sponsors. Uh, Prosperity Candle is based in, actually it's based in Florence, Massachusetts, but it's moving to East Hampton. And um, there's a very long story about Prosperity Candle and, and the founder, Ted Barber, has come to speak about it. But um, they do work abroad. Um, they started off with a business in a box for Iraqi war vid widows so they could make candles. Um, these candles, however, and they also have Afghani women working in, Ted Barber was going to be here today, but he just got back from Haiti where he's opening up another uh, a factory. But these candles were made here by Burmese refugees wow. Wow. based in the United States. So I love giving people these. <laughs> but thank you so much. And um, as I said, keep in mind, we've got um, Ryan Crocker and a lot of excellent programming coming up. So thank you. Bye-bye.